Welcome to The Feminist Lens, a production of Women's Media Group Chicago. Today's program is Breaking the Silence, Songs and Stories of Survivors of Sexual Violence. Most of the music you'll hear on today's show is compiled for the Voices and Faces Project CD under the leadership of Anne Reem, one of the voices you'll hear on today's show and founder of this project that seeks to create a safe space for sexual assault survivors to come together and share their names, faces, and stories to find support and strength. Other voices you'll hear on today's show are executive producer Maya Friedler and actress Shannon Metesky. I'm Kat Jarbo, and now here's our host, Marilyn Campbell. Thank you, Kat, and welcome to a new season of The Feminist Lens. As we get closer to the 2012 presidential election, we focus today's feminist lens on a subject that seems more urgent than ever, violence against women. There's been a lot of talk over the past few months from politicians, demagogues, religious leaders, and institutions, a lot of legislation, rhetoric, and definitions regarding women's bodies, reproduction, and birth control. And as for rape... If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. The claim that rape is unlikely to lead to a pregnancy has no biological plausibility. A woman who is raped has no control over ovulation or fertilization. A lot of talk, a lot of people talking, but who is really listening to the women? Instead of facts and figures, we center our show on the personal, on testimony, and how the arts have provided a continuous way for voices to be heard, not only now, but throughout the centuries, because as we all know, this subject is certainly not new. From the Trojan women to the rape of Lucrece and the Sabine women, from Chicago to the Congo, rape and violence against women has been a weapon of war and power since the beginning of time. It's part of our history, our literature, and our music. Pump, pump, blow the dent, the steaming sewers. Take the chance that only chancy chicks would take and kick. Walk home with icy brakes of spiky heels and clicks they make and walk through your cold neighborhood, but don't get raped. Knock on wood. Martina hobbled home, breathing in time to the sounds of her footsteps on the pavement. All the houses made hushy, silent sounds because it was a thick night at 3 a.m. Nobody was around. That's the worst time a part of her said. But most of her just said vup, tap, vup, tap, vup, tap, vup, tap, to her swinging legs. Pump, pump, blow the dump, the steaming sewers. Take the chance that only chancy chicks would take and cakewalk home with icy brakes of spiky heels and clicks they make and walk through your cold neighborhood, but don't get raped, knock on wood. What I Was Wearing a poem by Mary Simmerling. What I was wearing was this. From the top, a white t-shirt, cotton, short-sleeved and round at the neck. This was tucked into a jean skirt, also cotton, ending just above the knees and belted at the top. Underneath all this was a white cotton bra and white underpants, though probably not a set. On my feet were white tennis shoes, the kind one plays tennis in, and then finally silver earrings and lip gloss. This is what I was wearing that day, that night, that 4th of July in 1987. You may be wondering why this matters, or even how I remember every item in such detail. You see, I have been asked this question many times. It has been called to my mind many times, this question, this answer, these details. But my answer, much awaited, much anticipated, seems flat somehow, given the rest of the details of that night, during which at some point I was raped. And I wonder what answer, what details would give comfort, could give comfort to you, my questioners, seeking comfort where there is, alas, no comfort to be found. If only it were so simple. If only we could end rape by simply changing clothes. I also remember what he was wearing, 
that night, even though it's true that no one has ever asked. Lucky Star, an excerpt from Live Through This, a forthcoming book by Anne K. Reem. For all of the ugly details of being kidnapped and raped, the memory that remains most powerful is not of the exhausting and stupid degradations, but of the distant sound of a neighbor's stereo playing Madonna's Lucky Star as I was assaulted. Years later, I found a way to distance myself from that moment, turning it into irony. Madonna, I was a clash in Bowie girl, so it was such an indignity. But in reality, that Madonna song, however banal, became the outside world to me. Her music was a stand-in for life itself, for all of the frivolous things I wished for and suddenly stood to lose. I knew as I listened to that music that I was no longer of the world but outside of it, watching myself being raped, knowing that even if I lived, I could never go back to the place I was before. Hearing the sound outside of my apartment that night, the voices floating up from the street, the playing of a pop song I loathed but suddenly wanted to hear a thousand times more, was unbearably sad. I had never felt before or since more alone. In terror, I was so utterly transformed that I had become a stranger to myself. When abruptly, stunningly, I was released hours later, the sheer joy I felt rivaled nothing I had ever known. It was the joy of life being returned to me, the sense that however altered I might be, I was still there. In the months and years that followed, I sometimes longed for that moment of first freedom. I was at a turning point, but I couldn't see the difficult road ahead. I knew that I was going to live, yet had only an inkling of how different my life would be. It was a perfect, temporary elation. August 20th, 2012. Dear Congressman Aiken, I am writing to you tonight about rape. It's 2 a.m., and I am unable to sleep. Here in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I am in the city of joy to serve, support, and work with thousands of women who have been raped, violated, and tortured from this ceaseless war of minerals fought on their bodies. I am asking you and all politicians to get out of my body, to get out of all of our bodies. These are not your decisions to make. These are not your words to define. Why don't you spend your time ending rape rather than redefining it? Eve Ensler. The highly acclaimed, award-winning play, Ruined, by Lynn Nottage, premiered right here in Chicago at the Goodman Theater. In her preface, Nottage writes, I have often questioned why rape is an integral part of any war, but after interviewing the women in the Congo, I realized that it was not just a tool to humiliate the women or to degrade the opposing side's masculinity. It was a way to strip women of their wombs. In the Congo, the mixture of poverty and war was a lethal combination. Due to a lack of money, the human body becomes the weapon, the teenage boy, the terror, and the woman's womb, the battleground. The soldiers came and they took me from my home. They took me through the bush Raiding thieves, demons. She is for everyone. Soup to be had for dinner. That is what someone said. They tied me to a tree by my foot, and the men came whenever they wanted soup. I make fires. I cook food. 
I listen to their stupid songs. I carry bullets. I clean wounds. I wash blood from their clothing. And, and I lay there as they tore me to pieces. Five months. Five months. Chained like a goat. These men fighting. Fighting for our liberation. Still, I close my eyes. I see such terrible things. Things I cannot stand to have in my head. How can men be this way? I walked into the family compound expecting wide open arms and embrace. Five months suffering. I suffered every second of it. And my family gave me the backs of their heads. And he, the man I love since I was 14, chased me away with a green switch. And now I can never return home because my husband, the people in my village, they don't understand. Oh, they said they will, but they won't because underneath everything, they will be thinking she's damaged. She's been had by too many men. She let those dirty men touch her. She's a whore. In my life, my simple life, it's vapor. It's gone. Wake up, wake up. My mother said Go get your brother Tell him get out of bed Get into the car Just do as I say She packed a few things And we drove away This was no vacation this was an evacuation. You are listening to The Feminist Lens. Breaking the Silence is a production of Women's Media Group Chicago. To find out more information on this program and other shows, visit us online at WMGChicago.com. Watch on my mother from the passenger seat, but no matter how I try, Keep them white The windshield wiper Kept blinking like sleepy eyes All through the driving rain Away from the hurricane There's no need to scream and shout that's not what this is all about And don't you ever doubt There's more than one way out Evacuation route You are listening to The Feminist Lens. Breaking the Silence is a production of Women's Media Group Chicago. To find out more information on this program and other shows, visit us online at WMGChicago.com. And now, here's our host, Marilyn Campbell. There were 3,200 military sexual assaults reported in 2011. But given that most sexual assaults are not reported, the Pentagon estimates the actual number was probably close to 19,000. As one female recruit put it, I just had to suck it up. Because if I said, I don't sleep with men, I'm a lesbian, I'm the one who would have been out with the dishonorable. Did you know humans are the only species in which one sex consistently preys on the other? By persecuting women, men destroy the human race. Marilyn French, The War Against Women. 
Lying is done with words and also with silence. Adrian Rich. This year, a powerful investigative documentary called The Invisible War shines a light on the military's closed culture on sexual assault and exposes this silent epidemic. Most Americans assume that there is access to a system of justice. So that, for example, if you're a civilian and you're raped, you can call the police. The problem with the military is that instead, they have to go to their chain of command. She went to war and gave nine years of her life for them to take it and come back and say, you deserved it. And, you, and when you complained about it, you were welcoming it. The actions of my seniors, both in the assault and in the ensuing investigations, have really destroyed me. The thing that makes me the most angry is not even the rape in itself. It's the commanders that were complicit in covering up everything that happened. This is an organization that gives commanders an unbelievable amount of power. And I felt it as a lieutenant in Iraq. It's, it's scary. You appoint the prosecution, you appoint the defense, you appoint the investigator, you're in charge of the police force, you're in charge of the community. You own everything. Uh, you are a judge, you are a jury, you are executioner. This is not an issue of sexual orientation, this is simply an issue of power and violence. Male sexual predators, for the large part, have targeted whoever is there to prey upon, whether that's men or women. Whenever I see that, you know, there is uh, evidence that another woman has been sexually assaulted. The question I keep asking myself is, when does this ever end? Did you know that Rosa Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement, revealed in her personal papers a handwritten, first-person account of a near rape by a white employer? And remember Nafisatu Diallo, who was unwavering in her assertion that former International Monetary Fund chief Dominique Strauss-Kahn had raped her in the hotel where she worked? Two maids that have more in common than you might think. Both worked in the sort of low-status service position that then and now leaves these often invisible women vulnerable to abuse. Contemporary studies have shown that poor and immigrant workers are more likely to experience and less likely to report sexual violence and harassment. This subject was first explored in literature 200 years ago in 1797 by Mary Wollstonecraft in her novel Maria or the Wrongs of Women. Her character Jemima is unique in literature because it was the first time that any author had attempted to describe with compassion the personal thoughts and feelings of a female character growing up in abject poverty. The day my mother died, the ninth after my birth, I was consigned to the care of the cheapest nurse my father could find, left in the dirt to cry with cold and hunger till I was weary. Could I be expected to become anything but a weak and rickety babe? Still, in spite of neglect, I continued to exist. <laughs> I shudder with horror when I remember the treatment I had to endure. Often has my mistress thrown me from one side of the kitchen to the other, knocked my head against the wall and spit in my face, to which the name of bastard was commonly added. I had no one to love me or to make me respected. I was an egg dropped on the sand, a pauper by nature, 
hunted from family to family who belonged to nobody, and nobody cared for me. At sixteen, I suddenly grew tall, and something like prettiness appeared on a Sunday when I had time to wash my face and put on clean clothes. My master had once or twice caught hold of me in the passage, but I instinctively avoided his disgusting caresses. One day, however, when the family was at a Methodist meeting, he contrived to be alone in the house with me, and by blows and menaces compelled me to submit to his ferocious desire. And to avoid my mistress's fury, I was obliged in future to comply and skulk to my room at his command. The anguish which was now pent up in my bosom seemed to open a new world to me. I began to extend my thoughts beyond myself and grieve for human misery till I discovered with horror, ah, oh, what horror, that I was with child. I know not why I felt a mixed sensation of despair and tenderness, excepting that ever called a bastard, a bastard appeared to me an object of the greatest compassion in creation. Chimney falls and lovers blaze I thought that I was young Now I freeze in hand and bloodless veins as numb as I've become I'm so tired I wish I was the moon tonight Stacy is 16 and hiding she knows what her advice would be for the same person going through the same thing and she would give it to him in an instant but she's hiding behind what she's always known to keep hidden. Her greatest fears and worst tragedies, her real tears, the kind where she's sobbing over a tragedy. She knows how to shake them off and look happy, like nothing's happening. She lets others believe the same thing that they've been believing, that she's mature, outspoken, and wise beyond her years. Well, knowledge must melt in the substance of tears, because to me she's stupid, knows better. Told no one older than her who could do nothing but hold her at first. She didn't even want to be touched. Still kind of doesn't. Gets a tingle in her body. Flashbacks of the positioning of their bodies when she sees a young man with a square jawline. She knows that he has this. Because closed eyes and clenched fists could not erase the feeling of bone next to her. She is stuck between denial and belief. Insides confirms it happened, but mind wasn't fully present. So she's left as much as the reality as she could on her sheets. But what do you say to a grown man when he's inside of me? I mean her. See, it would be different if she was of age to make it consensual, but she isn't. And no matter how grown she looks, she's still a child and wants a mother to hold her and tell her it's okay. So bad now. See, I know her story too well. Like the backhand side of my wrist, the way it flickers and twists while doing poetry, because that's the same way it flickered the first night he touched me. She is me. I like to change her face in my mind, give her a different life and a different personality, try to make up everything about her and ignore the fact that we share a common history and bloodline and I have no sisters. This, this did not happen to me. It's Stacy, who's too stupid to tell her mother and the rest of her family that my uncle touches me on one occasion. He me didn't know how to stop it thank god i'm not a virgin because my cherry he would have popped it this is the one time i love the fact that i'm adopted well her see it's her fault in a way because even though she's small she packs a punch she could have ran scream yell call 911 but shay thought she was stacy i couldn't recognize myself in the two full mirrors in my room i saw stacy stay seeing shannon stop being shannon and be her the decision on who to be is making me crazy. We relate on what angers us, the things that anguish us. I'm beginning to lose control. I got loose control of reality, but truth is a member of my family has abused me. I'm 16 and too strong to still be denying. So tonight, I write Stacy's eulogy. 
because Shannon Rose Metesky has to claim her own story. So yes, this happened to me, but that makes no excuse why I still can't be standing. I will forever hate my knees, but I cannot stop walking. And this is for those of you still pondering. Still scrubbing skin off while taking a shower because your soul is dirty. Look at me. See that first you need to confess, then accept, and then try to move on and try your best to be strong. If you need a friend, call me. Because we can't all hold on to our Stacys. Now, final thoughts by Women's Media Group executive producer, Maya Friedler. The poet Adrian Rich wrote, The connections between and among women are the most feared and the most problematic and the most potentially transforming force on the planet. How sad it is for me and for the country to have gone through possibly the most productive period in American history for women the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we now witness a backlash where government leaders are trying to curtail our freedoms. The past successes of the women's movement are still very vivid. We just saw evidence of this within our American Olympic team, where women outnumbered men and garnered the most gold medals. And to think that only 50 years ago, the Amateur Athletic Union did not allow women to compete officially in any road races at all. Some thought that running long distance would cause a woman's uterus to fall out. The backtracking of women's rights in our country makes global sisterhood more and more difficult because women all over the world look to us for leadership. We owe a debt to Congressman Aiken for his comments about legitimate rape because his ideas revealed the silent beliefs of a larger community. It harkens back to songs I heard in the 40s, like a no that sounds like yes, and jokes about rape that ended in lines like, just lie back and enjoy it. Fortunately, we have made progress. No means no and rape is rape. But we still have, as Aiken reminds us, a world out there that echoes ideas of false science and strives to take us back to the time before Roe versus Wade, which empowered women to control their own wombs. The strongest voices at this time speaking to the truth about rape and the rights of women seem to come to us through music, theater, and literature as well as community leaders who understand the relationship of poverty to violence and how women can maintain their gains made by all those uppity women from the past and present. We celebrate their work. Many organizations continue to provide support, information, and understanding to sexual assault survivors right here in Chicago, across the country, and around the world, including RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization, Rape Victim Advocates, dedicated to the healing and empowerment of sexual assault survivors, SWAN, the Service Women's Action Network that seeks to transform military culture by securing equal opportunity and the freedom to serve in uniform without discrimination, harassment, or assault. You can find links to these safe places and more at our website, wmgchicago.com. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to our guests in the studio, Anne Reem and Shannon Bateski. Special thanks to the producers of The Invisible War. The Feminist Lens is a production of Women's Media Group Chicago and made possible in part by the contributions of Evelyn Salk and Robert Neems. Breaking the Silence was recorded in the studios of WFMT Chicago. Our audio engineer is Josh Savageo. Production engineer is Don Mueller. Our director, Alan Nowakowski. And audio editor is Kat Jarboe. Our executive producer is Maya Friedler, and our host has been Marilyn Campbell. 
If you liked what you heard, we'd like to hear from you at WMGChicago.com, and you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Kat Jarbo. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.